Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here in Mark Bonilla's studio. Mark, how are you? I'm great, now that you're here. Oh, you're far too kind. Of course, yeah. So I was looking at your, uh, your resume, your CV as it were, and there's lots of things to talk about. But the thing that jumped out at me in the middle of your notes was uh, Toy Matinee. That's because it was probably a different font. Yeah. <laughs> Larger size. Most. No, I, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I worked with a lot of guys around kind of the Kevin Gilbert kind of scene. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it actually started with Keith Emerson. Oh, wow. I was up playing in San Jose area with a band called JC and the Twisters, which is a three-piece, and we would never rehearse. We would just take requests from the audience. I mean, we, we were fearless. We would just basically play. You want, you want it? Bohemian Rhapsody? No problem. If one of us knew it, we would try it. You know? <laughs> so the, at least there was a way with a flashlight out of the floor. Well, there's a will, there's a way. Exactly. I see this guy come in at the back of the pub. And I'm play we actually were playing a tune. I was working with Ronnie Montrose at the time on a solo album. And we were playing a tune called White Noise, which was one of my tunes that we were working on. And I see this guy in the back come through, and it says, hey, look, you know, shit, the guy looks like Keith Emerson, you know. But what, what the hell would be Keith Emerson be doing here? And we finished the song. It was the end of the set. He comes up and introduces himself, and sure enough, it's Keith Emerson, you know. And so I'm, like, shaking his hand, kind of trying to get my bearings and... And he said, what was that last song you played? And I said, uh, it's called uh, White Noise. And he goes, it's good, that. Uh, you, you're going to record it. And I said, yeah. You know, and he goes, do you mind if I play piano on it? Uh, the only thing I could think of to say was, well, what have you done? You know, as a joke. Like, you know, like, I don't want to just let anybody in. And he goes, well, I was in a band called The Nice, and there was a band called ELP. I'm like, no, no, stop, 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 stop. I know who you are. I have posters of, of you in my room. That was a joke, you know. And... He said, and I, he asked me if I would want to go water skiing the next day. I said, uh, yeah. Like you do, you know. <laughs> so we're out water skiing. I'm just like being in a David Lynch film. I have no idea where the plot's going to go with this. And he said, I'm working with this guy, Kevin Gilbert, in uh, studio. And I said, he was in a band called Giraffe. And I went, oh, Giraffe, yeah, I, I, I'm that name, I know the name. And uh, <clears throat> so we're looking for a guitar player. And I was told that you were, you know, in the running for that, so go down and meet Kevin. And Kevin was didn't know who didn't know who I was, and so he was a little skeptical. You know, like, did you just bring this guy? You don't tell me, Keith. You know, and so whatever it was, we got together, and whatever I first played, we just rolled tape. And he went, "That was perfect. Do that again." And he hits record. We go to dinner that night. And I remember making a comment about the fact that I like everything. It was one of those areas where I wanted everything dry. I didn't like a whole lot of reverb. I said, I want everything sounding like the end of Pleasant Valley Sunday. And Kevin starts laughing. You know, I'm mean, going, oh, you know the song? He goes, I use that as an example for exactly what you do, the end of Pleasant Valley Sunday, because the end is just a complete wash of, 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 of you know, reverb. And, I, and he goes, are you a Monkees fan? And I went, I'm a huge Monkees fan. I said, but I would always have to listen to that stuff along with my Tiny Tim album in the closet, you know, so I didn't get ridiculed by, by you know, people. But I loved, you know, so we got in. Some of the it. best musicians in the world. Of course they were, you know, but, but you didn't think. The stigma then was the fact that, oh, they didn't play their own instruments, regardless of who these heavyweights were that were playing them in lieu of them until the Headquarters album. Yeah, yeah. Then we got into what groups we listened to. And, of course, we got right into Gentle Giant. We were huge Gentle Giant fans. We immediately bonded. It was just like, okay, we're, we got the same exact vinyl collection, you know. So we did the Keys thing, and he, you know, he's living down here, and, and I think Silver Lake at the time. And we were having these long, like, hour-long to three-hour-long conversations on the phone just talking about shit, you know. And he goes, you know, um, I, I said, I'm, I'm going to be doing this album for Guitar for the Practicing Musician, a solo album. And, and I said, you know, what do you think about producing it? And, and he says, I'll tell you what, move down here or come down here, stay in my, stay at the house. We'll do the album during the summer. And that's what we did. I, I picked up stakes and, you know, I left my wife everybody was up there, but came down here, lived in his house for like uh, the summer. And we recorded the basics at Pat Leonard Studio in, uh, in Johnny Yuma in Burbank at the time. And then did all the overdubs at, at Kev's living room, which was where he converted into a studio without telling his landlord. And uh, so, do you remember the? Do you remember the area? It was in Silver. Yeah, Lake. it was in Sherman Oaks, off of uh, Delgado. 
Oh, okay. Delgado, which was always his name that he used when he used when he would when we would write stuff for TV that we were embarrassed about about you know like cheesy stuff like Dark Justice. He would use his middle. We would use our middle name and our and our street we lived on. So he right. was Matthew Delgado, and I was Henry Stagg, and those <laughs> those, those those were our pseudonyms. Yeah. So we we just got into that there, and then at the end of that album, he said, you know, I'm this Toy Matinee thing. We have to go, you know, I'm going to start doing a promotional tour. How about you and I go to Japan as a tri- as a duo to promote it? And so we did. We went and just as a, as a trio. We had the, the MPC-60 drum machine and, uh, and maybe some bass. And then we would, the rest of it we did uh, by ourselves in Japan and just, you know, just locked in. As, and we were really good together working off of each other. You know, we had a same dark sense of humor, a lot of the same rhythmical timing and, and relatively similar histories when it came to music so we could pull from very remote resources and uh so we did that we got back here added spencer campbell as our bassist went out did a radio tour of the states <clears throat> came back here and then formed the rest of the band with toss panos on drums and cheryl crow on keyboards and then we went out and, and toured and in that time too we had a um we did a Mark and Brian, which was the big radio show in the town, asked us. We, we went on the Mark and Brian show, and they were huge supporters of us. And we were sitting in the lobby one day, and, they, and apparently, I guess Mark was talking about his favorite song, which was El Paso uh, by Marty Robbins. And his birthday was the next day. So I told Kevin, I said, look, man, why don't we redo El Paso? And I go, oh, and he goes, what's El Paso? He'd never heard mm. El Paso. I said, it's a song by Marty Robbins. I'll play it for you when we get back to the house. Go back to the house. I played for him. And we just went, okay. We, we put it up on, on two track, you know, and we then just copped the entire thing and redid it completely, changed a little bit of the lyrics and sent it to him as a birthday present the next day. And he was, he, he was just floored, played it on the, the air the next day. You know? Oh, wow. And I remember Kevin sitting back going, look at that, man. He goes, record it here today, hear it on the radio tomorrow. So that's promotion. <laughs> that's, that's old school, 60s, yeah. yeah. And then they asked us to host the show while they were gone. Wow. So we had to do a four-hour stint. Mark on, and Kevin. Yeah, Mark and Kevin. Uh, on the show, and and it happened to be fortuitously uh, uh, that morning. It was a complete rainstorm had hit, and so everything was backed up. So you had we had captive listeners on the radio, on their way to work, clogged to the four hundred five, and we were trying to think up things that we had to do. Like we got four hours to kill, and we would we would come up, we kind of outlined some stuff, and one of the things we decided to do was to write a song on the air. And so we would take like a lyric from somebody or a chord from somebody. And we did this all the way through the entire four hour block. And we said, we're going to take a final station break. Kevin and I are going to write the song. And when we come back, we're going to perform it. And that's exactly what we did. We, we worked Is at it. Is there a it. copy of this show somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, you know, and we performed it. It was called This One Goes to Eleven. That was the title of it. That, and all of the stuff was, was sent in by listeners, chords, lyrics. And then we would put a melody to it, you know. So, uh, uh, so that's it. So this is the unveiling of it. So uh, shall I? Shall I start it off? I think you Nancy you, Wilson. Yeah. Ready? Okay. Here we go. This one goes to eleven, written by the listeners of the Mark and Brian show, <clears throat> and performed by Toy Matinee. <laughs> Financial juggernaut continues unbated. Are we in America among the hated? My always warm and friendly smile has been jaded. As I stare at the court order, as it stated. This one goes to eleven. You caught me off guard in heaven, baby. <laughs> An odd side to line to that was I had done a Star Trek tape. I was a huge Star Trek, Trekkie fan, right? I understand. Back in, I want to say, 
in the early 90s, I had put a tape together. Actually, no, before that, I had put a tape together of all the one-liners from the original show that had any kind of sexual connotation, right? <laughs> and I made my own Star Trek episode where the debauchery was rampant. I mean, it was like, you know, and it was all just innocent lines from the show, but I had the music. I did it on a Porta Studio. Remember those four-track Porta Studios? So I had two tracks of the soundtrack from the original albums that when they had the original score, and I would just do this. I had no script. I just went for it. And just for my tricky fans, like, check this out, you know, just something to do. So I said, you know, Kev... I've got this tape. This might be down our alley. We could pretend that it's, we found it at the vaults, you know, Paramount vaults. It was an episode of them past the five-year limit when, you know, they were starting to get a little bit more debauchery on the ship, you know, and they were a little stir-crazy. And this is what, how you work off your, your sexual energy is to try different things where no man has gone before kind of thing. And we started playing sections of it during the show. And, you know, as a little excerpt, let's go back to the Enterprise, see where they are now, you know. Star Trek Episode Five, perhaps wrap up this Yeah, this we're going to wrap up the uh, saga here, that's right. Mark, why don't you tell us what's going on? Well, I happen. think Scotty has just about had it with everybody. I mean, it is his ship. Had it with everybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That was good. That wasn't even planned. Thank you. Carefully rehearsed spontaneity. That was good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think Scotty's a little, little, you know, kind of feels a little bit left out, slighted, let's say. So I think that he and... Uh, I don't know. Maybe he and Bones are probably going to get something together. Team up. There. Team up. Okay. Team up with the Enterprise security personnel. They're better armed than you are. <laughs> that was from an episode. I was, I'm sorry. I, I'm a Trekkie guy. Trekkie. Yes, Star Trek. But at any rate, at any rate, uh, I think we're about ready to join there. The final, uh, the final Mark installment. Mark Benia's Star Trek episode, uh, the last episode, part five. Here it is. Lad, you're going to need something to wash that down with. Well, I've got some stuff that would tranquilize an active volcano. It'll stick in his craw. Now, this isn't gonna hurt a bit. That's what you said the last time. Did it hurt? Yes. Bones, you can't stop now. Here's another morsel of agony for you. Ah! It fits like a glove, Captain. Then we were taking calls, and I noticed the call sheet. There's this flashing light from Paramount Studios. Uh oh. And I went, shit. Oh, dear. Shit. And I took it off the air. I wasn't gonna take it on air. So I, I picked up the phone and I said, hello? This is uh, Kelly Ferguson, Gene Roddenberry's assistant. This is in reference to your Star Trek. And I'm like, I'm going to get sued. I'm going to get sued. And I was like, yeah, I'm bracing for it. She goes, Gene <clears throat> heard that. And he thinks it's the most, the funniest thing he's ever heard. He oh, wants fantastic. you to come down to the studio and play it for the writers. And I'm like, is this a joke? You know, kind of a thing. And, and no. So the next day, I go down to the Paramount Studios. I God bless to... people have senses what? of humor. I, they did. They did. Yes. Especially Gene. Yeah. I go to the studio. I'm sitting in his office because he was still in a writer's meeting. I'm sitting there in the Vulcan, Vulcan Harpus up on the wall. All these Star Trek mm -hmm. artifacts, everything, the real stuff, and not just, you know. So I'm just, this is like I'm in a dream state. He comes in and he introduces himself. I'm like, hey, Gene, how are you? And, it, and, we talk for a minute. He brings the writers in, and we play the tape. It's on a cassette, and everybody's yucking it up, you know, and he goes, man, he says, I got to get a copy of this for Leonard and Bill. And I said, here, it's yours. You know, I just had it on my only tape of it. I was just like, I don't want to have to go home and, and you know, risk this. I'm going to seize the opportunity. So I gave him the tape, and he said- The only one. The only one. The only one. And- he says, what are you doing right now? And I said, absolutely nothing. What do you have in mind? And he goes, you want to go down and take a tour of the Enterprise? They were filming, they just wrapped filming uh, Wrath of Khan. Mm -hmm. And they were also doing the first generation, or the next generation, I'm sorry, the next generation. They would use a lot of the same sets. And so he's giving me a tour. I'm like walking where the engineering place where Spock dies. And I'm like tearing up. I'm putting my hand on the glass, you know, <laughs> spouting dialogue, right? And he's cracking up, and, I, and we're walking down the hall of the, of the Enterprise. I said, look, Gene, you have to indulge me here. I need to run down this hallway. Because in every episode of Star Trek, when you see the, the, the backward panning shot, there's always a red alert going on. The Klingons are outside, and everybody's running. I need to run down the hallway of the Enterprise. And he's like, oh, Jesus. So he goes, I'll tell you what. Go ahead and run. I'm, I'm going to do something. We go to the bridge of the Enterprise. They weren't using it that day. Everything had covers. It was dark. He calls a gaffer down, and they take all of the covers off of the bridge of the Enterprise. They light it, 
And he goes, go sit in the captain's chair. So I'm sitting in Captain Kirk's chair, <laughs> complete living out my let my wet dream of, of high school, you know, turning around going, these are guns control. This is a hurrah, you know, hitting the frequencies open, check out, you know, doing this whole nine yards. All from this stupid tape that I did. That you gave away. That I gave away. I yep. recreated it though. No, I, I okay. with Pro Tools, right? I was able to, I, cause I had like, I knew exactly the, 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 all, I had everything like written down what I did. And I recreated it much smoother, as a matter of fact. And I found a few other ones that I didn't know that, that went, oh God, how, well, watching starting going, how did I miss that one? How did I miss that one? You know, you have to familiarize yourself on penal procedures. Come on, I need that. I need that in the script. So I redid it and put my own stuff to it. So I do have that. It's it's available now. But it, it clocks in at about 13, 14 minutes, you know. Is there a link to it we can put here? Go on YouTube mm -hmm. and find it under Star Trek Lust Episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Lust Episode. You'll see it. It's it's there somewhere. But getting back to Kevin, this, this whole thing just kind of developed into a really cool relationship where we both... Uh, just really gravitated towards each other, had the same sense of humor, like I said, same musical abilities, and, and just, you know, so it was great. It was a great, it was a great friendship, you know, and obviously it, it ended, you know, because of his death, but, but, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal relationship, you know. I, I've thought many times about doing an episode on him because he's definitely one of those, you know, one of the greatest artists that nobody knows. Yeah, yeah. Simple yeah. as that. I, I was trying to think of a more lyrical way of saying it. No, but, that's but it's true. sort of the reality. Mm -hmm. And yes, the fact that he touched on so much prog stuff is, yeah. is, is great. Yeah. I've, 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 several times I've talked to Brian McLeod and Paul Ill about oh, doing, yeah. a, doing a prog band and everything, you know. Well, you know, when I was, and when I ended up joining and playing with Keith mm -hmm. and playing with UK, you know, with Eddie Jobson, was another, you know, I, I would always think of Kevin going, God, wouldn't he love this? Wouldn't he love us being in the same, you know, in, in the same band doing this kind of stuff, you know, because it was, that was our passion was that stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, and trying to find, he was the closest thing I ever had to a musical brother where, or a musical twin, as far as our deep knowledge and appreciation more than anything else of the particulars. You know, we were both prog nerds, complete prog nerds. And, you know, we shared so much of the same stuff, and then we would ha we would d we would have arguments about you know nerd arguments, you know about oh no 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 you can't you can't say John Luke Ponty was a better violinist than the Mahavishnu Orchestra than Jerry Goodman for these reasons, you know <laughs> stuff like that, just you know these meaningless trivial co that, that would just give us you know complete energy, you know like that. You know, yeah, so it was. It was great, though. We, it was, it was I just... got to know Ray on a very surface level from uh, Gentle Giant because I had produced a band that he wanted to sign to a label a few years ago, uh -huh. and also uh, my best friend since childhood is the drummer for the Sundays. Oh, okay. And Ray produced the Sundays' yeah, first yeah. album, yeah. Reading Writing. What an amazing man, Keith would tell me about Gentle Giant because they would tour with Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer. And it's just these guys, we'd be off with our women, you know, going to the hotel. They'd be in the dressing room after the show rehearsing stuff that they blew that they needed to get improve on. They'd be in there, like, taking notes and, and, and evolving constantly. They were just the consummate prog band. They were a prog band's prog band. You know, there was nobody, in my opinion. Well, they were a family band, weren't they? Yeah. Brothers. Yeah. Brothers, so, so they were... were you always have, yeah, like the Everly Brothers or Edgar and Johnny Winter, these people that, mm -hmm. that there's a DNA click yeah. that happens where it's unspoken. And you just know. You know how to harmonize because you, you grew up with the same music, so you bend your notes in the same way or, and your vocal, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, it, it shows. The, the, the familial DNA stuff really comes out, especially in that band. It's just to this day, no one has touched them, in my opinion. So it's interesting we started with Tommy Matinee because that actually is how you met Keith. Mm -hmm. Keith brings you in, then you, you meet Kevin. Tell us a little bit more about the blossoming relationship with Keith because you did quite a few records. Yeah, well... We, I would, we would keep, I would keep bumping into Keith. Like we would tour, we would be over in Japan uh, with Toy Matinee, and here comes Keith into the Lexington Queen. Like, what are you doing here? You know, he was off with the best, which was the, you know, the, the Skunk Baxter and and uh, all the guys in that band. I think Joel Walsh was the band, and we would just keep bumping into each other. Like, okay, there's got to be something going on here, right? And so in ninety, no, 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 way before or way after that, uh, two thousand. I can't remember now, 2005? Yeah, maybe 2005. He called and said, hey, um, I'm going out for a tour. 
what would you think about fronting the band? And I said, I would love to do that. Are you kidding me? So we got together and rehearsed. And, and we'd gotten together a couple of times before then and, and done some stuff. We worked out a, an arrangement of the piano concerto with, or, with band. And we just got on so well and went out and toured. And Stuart Young, Keith's manager, had come up to me. And he says, I've never seen Keith smile on stage before. He's, he's having so much fun. Is this something you're doing? And I'm going, no, I'm just me. And, but we get along really well. And I think what it was, maybe, he was always lead, having to shoulder a lot of the weight in ELP. A lot of the orchestral way, he was always, you know, where you had Carl on his, on the drums. All this, I mean, all these parts are integral. But Keith held down most of the orchestral weight, which is a lot. It was a lot that he was doing. Not to take anything away from Greg Lake and all his brilliantness and, and all of that stuff, but... And cozy for a minute? Yes, and cozy as well, yeah. So with me in the band as a quartet, I was able to pull away some of the responsibility, melodic responsibility. So he could, he loved comping, and he never had a chance to do much of it in ELP, because he always had that other hand on the moog, you know. And so here he was able to really relax a little bit, and, and he, he professed as much. He just said, it's, you know, this is great. You could just take that, and I can just be back here playing chords on some of this stuff. And so that became kind of a thing. We, we redesigned a lot of the ELP stuff for quartet. And he had told me once, which was, was just wonderful to hear, he says, if I'd known about you back then, this would, ELP would have been a quartet. We, I, would, I would have loved to have that, you know. But I'm like, hey, well, we're doing it now. So, uh, and it was great because it, 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 we were able to redefine a lot of the stuff like we did with Lucky Man and some of the other tunes. Re, re, you know, put a new band on the hat, you know, and, and to be able to re, reconstruct it in a way that... I suppose for him it was probably be careful what you wish for. You know, having a three-piece making it keyboard-centric rather than guitar-centric for the time was probably quite exciting. It was. And after a while you wake up going, oh, wow, it's all about me. He would always be living under that, that moniker of greatest key, rock keyboardist, you know, in rock. That weighed heavily on him, especially in the later years when his fingers weren't, you know, he had, because he, he had focal dystonia, which meant your, these two fingers would curl involuntarily under. And so he would be doing this and they would do that and he would have to play with three fingers. This left hand was affected at all. So trying to play the stuff that he Is that wrote. Is incurable? No. Not, well, not, not, it is to a certain degree, but there's research now that's going on, which was the tribute show that we did for him. All the money went to that, to treating focal dystonia. So having him try to do that with three fingers that was clearly difficult to do with five, mm. he had a hard weight on him. And so that's why I would say, hey, let me take that line. I, I've, you know, I can, I can pull that line. Mm. And so we would do that a lot, you know, and, and, and it became, it, it, evenly distributed the responsibilities in the band that way. And so that's why he was able to enjoy it, was he was able to, to relax on certain parts and other parts he would nail. After that initial tour, we got approached by Universal Music to to, what do you guys think about doing a record together? And Keith said, well, I will only do it if you produce it. And I'm like, okay. And you got to understand that this is a weird position for me because the, he was one of my heroes growing up. So for me to tell him if something wasn't up to par is very, it'd be like Gilmore saying, well, Gilmore, can you, can you, can you get a little more feeling and space in that guitar? You know, like, yeah, who the hell am I to tell him? That kind of stuff. It was, it was very weird for me to do that. It wasn't for him. He had no problem with it. But for me, I had to get over that hump. And I remember going to Steve Picaro and asking him, you know, I gotta have to do this. What do you think about that? And he goes, you have to do it. You know, and I said, I'm not sure how I want to approach this. And he goes, and he said to me, he said, approach it like you're, you're as a fan. Mm -hmm. And I went, I was thinking that. Yes, yes. And he was talking about if, if I was a fan, what do I want to hear? Oh, I see. I see. That makes sense. And I want to hear that Moog. I want to hear that organ. I want to hear that piano stuff. You know, j th those things that, that were iconic that he defined. But in an updated in an updated way so we we put together 
you know, he brought all his rig over here. We had the huge, uh, you know, Moog over here for the whole summer. And I would love just watching my musician friends come in and do the double take, the Hanna-Barbera, you know, look, is, is that, yeah, that's it. Holy shit, you know, and they would be bringing fruit, like posing like it was a celebrity, you know. It was so funny <laughs> seeing these guys, complete fanboys and girls going through, you know. So we got all these different sounds out of this thing that we never got before. Steve would come over and program some of that stuff as well for Carl. And then I got on and was able to get up the reactor and some other digital stuff of new kind of things that we would work on that Keith was totally into, like, you know, pushing the horizons a little bit more in that area. And then the, 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 the vintage organ sound that was just definitive that no one else has been able to replicate, that kind of stuff, the, the staples of that. And we sat and I said, and somewhere on the album, you're going to do a fugue. I want something like the middle of Trilogy. You know, in the middle of the endless enigma, something doesn't have to be long, but I want that brilliance. I want it in there, you know, and and it was interesting, the dynamic, because he would be over in the corner here and and we'd be doing stuff. And I go, it's not quite not quite there, you know, and then he would go, all right. And we do two or three takes and he got over this weird kind of a hump where he goes, "Okay." Run it again. And then it'd be like five, six, seven takes of like brilliance. And now I'm going to go, okay, how am I going to sort this out? Now, this is all, I had the, the exact opposite issue of, I've got too much good. I've got too much wealth of, inf- of, of information and, and great musical clout. And so, but it became this thing where it was a great, we had a great mutual competition because he would bring something. And I go, God, that's, that's amazing. And I would come in the next day, and I said, check this out. It was a tune called Place to Hide. I remember this incident. And I played it for him, and he was looking at me, and he goes, you bastard. <laughs> you know? And he goes, let me have that. You know? So I gave him the recording. He, he went right. He was just, just got here, and he went home you know, with the music. And he came back the next day with this amazing piano stuff that was just absolutely gorgeous. You know? and, and he says, I was inspired. You know, and that's how we did it. We traded back and forth on that stuff. And there was never any, nah, don't try that. Don't do any of that stuff because he would get crazy with stuff. And, and it was great. He had so much fun not having to be edited at all, you know, and, and, and I think that's probably a part of what kept us, you know, in such amicable relationship was the fact that we both congratulated each other's sins for that shit, you know, was that thing where we just both, supported everything yeah you both rose to the occasion yeah, yeah. you yeah. challenged each other yeah, yeah. that's it, amazing and it was it was great and for me it was just like watching him compose things it was a we were in vienna uh playing a show and at the beginning of touch and go he would always like do some kind of a keyboard like intro right off the top of his head and that night he's just like bum 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 like is this a is this some vintage thing that I've never heard? You know, and he's in the middle of playing it, and I'm over there going, "What is that?" And he goes, "I don't know." <laughs> and he says, "Well, don't stop." And I goes, "I don't intend to." You know, and, and you know, there's a crowd, and I'm I'm praying that Keith Wexler has a dat rolling because uh, normally yeah exactly, yeah. and thank God he did. He had a dat rolling. Uh, it was amazing. So I took that and I you know, and it was in weird time signatures and everything because he was just channeling. And I, I scored it out and I, I wrote it for band. You know, I wrote the bass line and the drums with all the time shifts in it. And it, it's, a, it's called Blue, Blue Inferno. It's on the Keith Emerson band album. But it was one of those things that those channels were always open for him as far as just stuff coming through. You know, when we, whenever we would do, you know, a show, 50% of it was improvisation, you know, like where we go in Tarkas, you know, and so it kept things fresh, it kept things new, and we would find things, you know, as you do, you know, when you don't have to worry about a backing track, you don't have to worry about sequences, you know, staying track, you can go off on these little offshoots and, and hunt for game that you normally don't hunt for and, and bring back something good to eat, you know, and, and that's kind of what we did, you know, and so it was very pioneering. And, 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 and great in that aspect as well, you know, where we, we would discover stuff. He was unbridled. You know, he was given permission to do that, you know. And so that's what was so great about that. And it, it followed into the, into the uh, symphonic area, too. Tadie Mikkelsen, conductor from Norway, phenomenal conductor, um, worked with Keith. And then Keith had him come here to America. And we, went, we eventually went to Munich to record the Three Fates Project, which was an orchestral project. And... 
at that point, I really understood what Keith's contribution was to music because here, his first foray into, into classical, which was during the Works album, was nightmare for him because no one took him seriously. All the classical players were like, who's this upstart? You know, they were, they gave him attitude. They just hated being there and he had to struggle. So he had that PST, you know, or PDA, whatever the word is. PDST. Thank you. See, that's why you're here to keep me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> Going in, we, we had to really, I really had to talk him into it. And so did Tadier about, it's not going to be the same now, okay? This, this, this is not the same thing, but he had reservations about it. And we, we went there, the orchestral players were coming up and going, Keith, you're the reason I'm doing this. You're the reason I'm here. Oh. Because back in the day... Right, it's that age group. Yeah, yeah, they yeah the said, gateway drug. Yes, they're hearing ELP, yes. they're, they're discovering... Well, and they would say, you made classical music cool for yeah. us because you did fanfare. You did, you know, pictures at an exhibition. Yeah, who's going to know Bosorsky? Right, him? right, exactly. And that's how I was. It was like, you know, I, I would hear the, I would hear the classical. I said, this is so cool, you know. And when you were first weaned on the rock and roll version of it, and so Keith, as you say, made that 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 wormhole, that gateway, open up that we were able to pass without prejudice back and forth between the classical and the rock world. For Class- me, it was the gateway drug the other way because my father. Oh, it was all classical music and a bit of jazz, mm-hmm. but mainly classical music. And then I discovered ELP and Queen, you know, like yep. Bohemian Rhapsody. And right. that, that allowed me to get into rock. Right, yeah. So, it, it yeah, it worked. It was a two-lane both street ways, yeah. that worked both ways. Yep. Rock gained credibility in the classical world, mm-hmm. and classical world gained credibility in the rock world. And so you had this wonderful exchange going on in Munich with that, you know, and and because he thought, I, no, I didn't think anybody was going to be here after the first day, and they gave us, we're still here, you know, we're still here. Every day we became the joke, we're still here, Keith, we're still here. And there was a moment where he was in the back of the hall, we were doing Tarkas, a r- arrangement of Tarkas orchestrally, and I went back to hear how it was back there, and it, had, it was tears coming down. And I'm going, you're right, you know. And he goes, he says, you have to understand that I wrote this piece on an old player piano in my parents' basement when I was in my early 20s, always imagining this moment of, of orchestral. He says, that's why I did synth. That's why I took up playing synthesizer. It was the closest thing I could get to orchestra. But this is how I always heard it. You know, Incredible. so it was it was great to be part of that full circle, you know, of that. And so because when you hear the stuff done with ELP, it, as we all did, we were it, we knew right where we were when we heard Tarkas. We knew right where we were when we heard Lennis Enigma. But then taking those pieces and then orchestrating them for symphony, you realize how beautiful and how timeless they are when they're done by a proper orchestrator. When you hear the stuff done orchestrally, you realize how timeless the stuff is and that he was indeed a modern-day composer. He wasn't just a keyboardist. He was a composer. And when you hear all of that stuff in that light, you know, it's like if you have a, if you have a three-dimensional statue that you hear and you have a light shining down on it, right? And the contours are however they are from that angle. But then you turn that and you see it from a different angle. Oh, my God. Look at this. I didn't, I never noticed this fold in the skin was here. This vein was here. The look, um, you know, that the, the shadow throws like, like light at the end of a day, how much more beautiful it looks at sun, at sundown or almost sundown, how it casts a different shadow on things. That's what classical music did. It made that music seem a lot more, just, just a lot more relevant, even as relevant as it was. This put it in league with WC, it put it in league with Ravel, put it in league with Sibelius. All the people that Keith aspired to, you can see now why they gave him the sign off on it. Went, yeah, that's good. Copeland said, I don't quite understand all of it, but I like it. Yenistera, I love it. This is how I originally intended the piece to be. This is the kind of stuff, the accolades that Keith would receive from the masters. And now you, you, you really understand why that was what it was. And to be able to then meld the rock band into that not as a lot of times and most times actually i think when you have that 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 melding between rock band and orchestra is one of them usually takes the hit where they're way in the background or it's the opposite way but what we tried to do was make sure that both 
had equal weight at different times. We'd have an orchestral moment. We'd have a rock band moment. We'd have all of these synergistic moments in between. Without naming the particular pe musician or the piece of music, sometimes it's an intonation thing, isn't it? It's with guitar, with fixed points. Obviously, we know about equal temperament and mm -hmm. you know C sharp and D flat are actually two different notes. Mm -hmm. It's an approximation yeah. um, on a piano and obviously on a guitar. I find that sometimes the thing that bothers me most, listening to like rock stuff against you know, stringed instruments, and you get that kind of intonation rub and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, well, and also, also in Europe, you know, your your A440 is A441. You know, they're they're tuning up a little bit from from what we do here in America. Plus, and it's interesting to bring that up because the other variances that, that go beyond that are rhythmical variances, and this is something that Tadier Mickelson was able. It really changed my life in working with him and Keith. Was the fact that there's no clicks in symphonic music, nor should there ever be. I understand it if you're scoring for film where you have to hit a cut. But Toddy said, I'm not, we're not playing clicks, I don't do that stuff. Because the, the ebb and flow of an orchestra, that's the reason for the orchestra. You know, we were doing Malambo where it was like da 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 you don't do it like that as da 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 there were these these delays and the, you know, the, 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 the fluctuation of tempo was part and parcel to the song. You don't just play it like that. You have to slow down. You have to speed up. All of those things, which are nightmares for drummers because they don't want to ever to be appear as if they have shitty time, right? <laughs> they pride themselves on their meter, right? So poor Troy Laqueta, who, I pulled from Tesla, consented to do this, uh, and I, I kind of roped him into it because I was in I was in Mongolia at the time, and I and I called him. I said, "Hey, uh, Troy, what are you doing uh, in this block of time?" And he goes, mm, "Nothing. It's good. You're coming to you're coming to Mongolia, and then you're going to Munich, huh? What do you mean? You know, you're going to play in the orchestra, huh? What? You know?" And he he was amazing what he did. Never had any experience playing with an orchestra, following a conductor, but he was asking Tadier constant questions all the time because he wanted to learn, he wanted to absorb. He did a remarkable job with this stuff. It was not easy. Um, did he listen to classical music? Uh, no. Oh, wow. No. Uh, he was familiar with some pieces, but he sure knew it afterwards, you know. But the fact that he, I, I knew that he was the right guy for the job because of his fire and because of his adaptability and his courage. I knew that he would go into this and he would shed this stuff until he had it. And he did. And, uh, but the, the great thing about these things were the back phrasing, all of the things that you did to stretch things so that you don't all hit at the same time. You hit slightly off so that it gives weight. If you, if you, uh, chucked a whale up in the air, and you let it land on the cement, it's not going to go, it's going to go gadunk, right? The head first, then the tail, which indicates a lot more weight and girth than just going, boom, perfectly on, on, on cue. And that's what orchestras do, where they'll go, gaunt, like that, where it sounds much bigger. And those are the types of things that you don't think about so much in rock as are normal things that you do in, in classical, where you have these variances, these these uh, these inaccuracies, if you will, uh, that actually make the stuff breathe and become organic. And so we were able to be incorporated into that. And Tadier, in his infinite wisdom, knew where the 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 holes or where the 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 the, the palette for orchestras here, but then we had subsonic moog that would fit this area kick down here that you don't get in the orchestral range. Top stuff, higher registration than, than uh, uh, your piccolo, where you'd get a full amount of, of spectrum, sonic spectrum, that you wouldn't get with either of the things by themselves. And we were able to meld all of that together into a, a full band, which was full. I mean, it was we would sit there and interrelate all of this stuff. And that was what made the project so rewarding and so life-changing, especially for me. Uh, the, the, the phrasing and things that I learned from Tadier, because we did like three of my pieces as well, and then Keith brought a couple of his pieces, that new ones that we did as well, to make a full album worth of stuff. And this is what it comes down to, and I always try to tell my students and stuff this about channeling. It's very important. Uh, when we think that music comes from us, 
we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Because that's like going out in the desert with a canteen of water. I got my water, man. It's, I filled it up myself. I'm, I'm going out. One of these days, that canteen is going to run dry. What do you do now? I got no more water in there. Ah, writer's block, right? No, there's no such thing. If you look at creativity as a river that runs alongside that desert, all you have to do is you got to go over there and you dip your cup in, you can drink. Keith was a, was a master at channeling. He never ran out of ideas. And I learned a lot from that. Myself, speaking privately, I've never run out of ideas. Now, not all the ideas are, are spectacular, of course. None of us are going to take credit for that. But at the end of the day, if I need to write something, it'll be written. And I don't know what's going to happen. And that's the thing is you have to give up control of your brain and let the shit run through you because it all goes through you. It doesn't come from you. The only thing that comes from you is to keep your car tuned up so that whoever wants to drive it, it'll respond to them. You know, I always think of it now as like firemen up in the loft. You know, they're up there reading a magazine, watching TV. And then the fire alarm rings. What do they do? They come down the pole. Where's the fire? Well, this is the fire alarm. This is the fire alarm. Once they hear that, they go, ah, somebody's, I'm needed down there for some reason. I'll come down. And I know you've probably done it. I'm sure everybody else has probably done it, written something. And you come back, you go, I don't even remember writing that. I don't, how the hell did I come up with that idea? I don't even remember. I could never do that again if I had to. That's why. Because you don't, you, you're not responsible for that. You know, and Keith would never take credit for his stuff. And for that reason, he was just like, yeah, I don't know. Somebody wrote it. I mean, you know, and, it, and it's right. It, that's it. And when I had to write, I had to write two classical pieces plus an adaptation for one. And I wrote something. This was funny to me. It just, it, it cracked me up when I, when I think about this. I wrote this piece. We did it over there. I'm up in the, I'm up in the loft with uh, uh, Torsten Schreier, who was the, uh, he was like the Rick Rubin of classical music as far as producer. And he, he started to ask me questions. You were working on this piece. He goes, so where did you study? I go, study? What are you talking about? He goes, well, conservatory, what did you study? And I go, I'm studying any conservatory. I'm a rock guitar player. I'm just, you know. And he goes, well, you must have studied Mahler. And I said, no. I, I, I'm a Debussy uh, Ravel fan. And he goes, and he started to get, he started to get um, the vein here started pulsing a little bit on his neck. And he goes, well, this sounds like something Mahler would have written. And I went, well, thank you. That, that's great. Uh, so you're telling, you know, he's like, well, you're telling me that you haven't, you haven't studied, you don't study classical. I said, no, I just listened to it. And it, it, it got to a point where he wouldn't talk to me because it just, it screwed up his paradigm of the fact that you're supposed to go to conservatory, you're supposed to learn these things, then maybe you can compose something like, like this particular thing, whatever this is. I just did it. Now, I, don't, I didn't know what I was doing at all. I, I just, you know, and, and, and it proved to me that, okay, I can fool this guy into thinking I did all these other things, and I didn't. But it's the channeling thing. You can write basically anything if you give yourself up. And... I watched that in Vienna when Keith was doing that. He just, what are you doing? I don't know. But it was such an important lesson that I've held all the way through now. It's the fact that I don't fear anything anymore because something will come. You know, it's the build that they will come, you know, it's the field of dreams thing. It is really true. And the real artists that I've talked to since the real people never take credit for their stuff. They know it's like, yeah, I'm just lucky I was there when I tripped over this rock that I didn't put there. But I knew well enough to pick it up and run with it. And that's really what it was, you know. And so that's, that was such a huge lesson, you know, for me as well as a composer and as a, as a player. You just, you have to surrender yourself. That's the hardest thing to do for a lot of players. They're, they're so used to technique and, and getting all their notes right. And, and, and it's like, no, it's not about that. It's about making mistakes. That's what's important because that shows that you're on terrain that nobody's traveled yet. If you twist your ankle going down that forest, you know, there's a re that what's down at the bottom of that? A real nice creek. Check it out, you know, and that's, that's what you have to do. You have to be willing to make mistakes. That's, that's, that's the wonderful. most important thing. There's a massive emphasis at the moment on, you know, having to understand, you know, all musical technique before <laughs> you even can write a song. I've watched breakdowns of videos all the time where they're like, this is what he did. He did this and he did that. And then I asked the people that have written these songs, they're like, I wasn't thinking about anything to do with theory when I wrote that song. Yeah. Well, Ennio Morricone, I remember one interview one time, they were asking about this brilliant thing where he had just done this timpani thing. 
You know, because that was brilliant. The fact that you would let up to this thing and you were just this minimalist thing. And he goes, oh, that was only because that was the only instrument in the, in the place. We had to put something in there. It was, it was, had nothing to do with everything that they had painted. You know, it's like Life of Brian. Well, no, what the sandal means is for us yeah. to do this. And it's like, no, it isn't. He just, the sandal dropped off his foot, you know. But that's, you're right. It's, it's, it's so much studying about the afterthought of it. But they're, what they're missing is the main point, is the fact that, they didn't know what they were doing. They just went for it. And, you you know, it was Bukowski. There was a, a piece in one of his poems that I put on my first album because it resonated with me. He said, and they played Bartok, who knew what he was doing, which meant he didn't know what he was doing. And I thought that was such a great synopsis of the creative experience. You don't know what you're doing, nor should you. You can figure it out later. It's like John Cleese says in his book on creativity, if you've read it. It's brilliant. He talks about the tortoise brain and the hare brain. The tortoise brain is the one that says, that's your creative brain. Do not analyze what you're doing. Just let it flow. Later, the hair brain can come in and go, okay, that's a little bit too long. We can cut that bit out there. That's great. You're analyzing it. But don't analyze shit when you're in the middle of creating it. It's counterproductive. It's counterintuitive. You don't want that. You want to just flow. Later on, you can sort the bits out, you know, but that's, and that's what the people you're talking about, that's what they do. I wasn't thinking anything like that. I was just coming, that sounds good. Your ear is the judge. What sounds good is good. I don't care if it's theoretically, you know, not, not conducive to the class approach on that thing who gives a shit it's 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 raw creativity that's what you want to capture because it if it doesn't go through you and you don't capture it it'll go to the next person it's energy and it's never created or destroyed it's just redirected that's why you can have the same idea as somebody else you know same riff somebody else it's all out there you just have to you're, you're we're all radio antennas right and we're all picking up whatever station is in whatever skip is in there nighttime there's a different radio station comes through oh what's that that's great you know so at different times of the day and night you have different radio stations that are coming through on your antenna and you grab it while you can because if you don't it'll go to the next person it doesn't matter it's not it's impartial creativity is impartial you know. Talking of creativity, I want to talk about your guitar playing, and I want to hear you play some guitar. You do. I mean, okay. I've heard you play guitar, but I want to, in the flesh. Okay. Now, for those of people that haven't noticed, you're left-handed. I am. Yeah. My guitar teacher, back when I was 10, says, you know, you're going to just let you know before I start teaching you, do you want to learn right-handed or do you want to learn that left-handed? Because if you're going to learn left-handed, you're going to have problems in the future getting guitars and all of that. And I said... There's nothing to think about. I was left-handed. Thank you, please. You know, and my dad made me an acoustic guitar that right-handed, and he flipped it. You know, and he put it, he made a little pick guard on the other side for me. You Lovely. Know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I didn't have my first electric till I was in high school, and it was fun. I was playing acoustic guitar, and it, I remember the time I had super slinkies on this ES 335 because I was a huge Alvin Lee fan, and. I remember going, my God, I can't play it because my fingers were so freaking strong that they were pulling the strings off the neck as I was used to waggling the strings on an acoustic guitar. And I thought, oh, my God, I was crushed because I thought I can't play electric guitar. It's, I'm too strong for the damn thing. Well, I, obviously, it just took string gauge manipulation and learning how to back off the energy level, you know, that I was fine. This was a tune uh, that was actually the first skateboarding movie that came out called Airborne. Oh, and well. it was yeah, like was way back in the way back in the day, and they they pulled this off the album to use it for that. So I'm gonna try this. I haven't I've rehearsed it. This is my disclaimer right now. So anyway. <laughs>
No bad for no. Well, no I think I'm sick, man. Yeah, that, that, this you need to you need to be able to kind of uh, stretch and warm up a yeah, little bit. Yeah. That's like trying to jump on a on a plane real quick. You know? No, I appreciate it. That was fantastic. Well, a couple of things. Obviously, I couldn't help noticing you're a Yamaha guy, which is great. Oh yeah, we love our Pacificas and our Rev Stars and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This was um, I had done this one. Uh, Leo Knapp when used to work at Yamaha when it was back on Weddington in North North Hollywood. And uh, I was a huge, I was always a huge comic fan. And so I pulled out my comic books and uh, found like the cool drawings of all of them. And I redrew them all. Oh, wow. And then uh, put them on separate boards and they photographed it and then they laid it in. So I had all my guys with me. It was just, what's my early influences? They always picked Hendrix and all. I guess, no, 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 it was Thor. It was Spider Man. <laughs> Those are way before. Yeah. Um, but then all of these, if you can see up on all of this stuff, these were all the drawings on the first page of the comics that you'd send away for like novelty stuff Onion Gum, Hypno Coin, Secret Spy Scope, all these cool things that kids, Incredible. that they would rope the kids into, right? So those are the actual drawings that were on that first page. And then we took a piece of a reflective pearl, put it down, put a piece of lighting gel, and then put this uh, transparency over the top and then epoxy them all. So all of that is there. And, and then these here are the Gary Erickson ruby saddles. These are all, if you notice, that's all rubies laid in there. Oh, wow. And they're in the, they're in the string tree here, and they're also in the, in the nut here, little tubes. So everywhere that the string falls, it's on a piece of stone, like, like hard stone. And they don't cut the I string. was trying to figure out that nut. Yeah, that's what this is. If you notice, they're little donuts that are in there. So everywhere that the string passes, it's on stone. So the, you get a much more of a, a fundamental tone. And a lot more sustained, and, and a uh, lot more expense, I imagine, with rubies. Uh, yeah, <laughs> doesn't sound cheap to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, Gary, Gary was brilliant. Is brilliant. So, so uh, how long have you had that guitar? I've had this probably since '94. I want to say '94. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, so it's uh, it's it's my staple guitar. This is the one that I use mostly. But the new Rev Stars, like I say, I love those Rev Stars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What what are the pickups in it? These, uh, this was, we can't figure this out. This is a Yamaha pickup that was an individual coil. 
Uh, I think it may have been fashioned after a PJ Marks pickup, single mm-hmm. coil. And then this is a, uh, a um, D'Addario uh, Duncan Custom. You know, this is a Wilkinson, and I always like to have my my bar parallel so that I can play because I do a lot of, you know, I'll do a lot of bending with the heel of the handle as I'm picking, you know. You know, and in, in, in style Beck would, would use um, for that. I was noticing that. I, I, your technique reminds me of lots of bits and pieces, you know, well, a little bit of a Beck with the way he uses yeah. the bar. Well, I remember when I, I had saved up to get my first Les Paul custom, right, mm-hmm. left-handed. So I had saved up all my Because you saw Blow by Blow and you yes, thought, I must get yes. that. Okay, right? <laughs> now. And then you found out he didn't use the Les Paul then, in the album. <laughs> you check, the, check this out. I got the Les Paul black, the black Les Paul, right? Yeah. We're at, a, we're at a, a club, and I'm going to try it out. I'm going to debut my new... And I hear Goodbye Pork Pie Hat coming yeah, over the radio. Yeah. And went, what the hell was that? Because he's going, you know, yeah. You know, he's doing that shit. And went, how's he doing that? He says, it's a wobble arm. I looked down at my list, Paul. No f***ing wobble arm. You know, <laughs> I took it back to the next day to Leo's Music. I sold it. Oh, wow. I sold it back at a discount because they wouldn't let me have it. for the And I bought... Pieces to a Charvel because they wouldn't make it left-handed. They would just give me oh. the body and the neck. And I had Gary Brower up in San Francisco put the thing together for me, which is my Dragon guitar, which is uh, it's uh, uh, it was a guitar I, I did on the first album, so that I could have a wobble arm. You know, yeah. and then I, it changed my life from that point on because all of those things that Jeff did, catching things in midair with the bends and all those things, it just didn't occur to me. Until I heard that album and it was like, God, you know, just what what control, you know, and so that was a huge leap from blow by blow, which is all bends with yeah, his fingers. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why it was like you went from that, you know, that to that white strat, you know, on the corner, and that's what it is he's doing. Now Hendrix would do that, but he didn't do it in the same way. He, it was more for waggling and for effects and things like that that he did it for, which was brilliant as well. But Jeff really took it to a level that no one. You know, up to that point, had ever taken it, you know, and and so yeah, so that was. Um, I did, I made the same mistake when I when I met him. I said to him, "Where's the Les Paul you use?" And he goes, oh, "I didn't use that." And he, <laughs> "I used this." And he reached around and put on my lap the the Seymour Duncan Telecaster. Yeah, and that's what he used on yeah. Blow by Blow. Yeah, with a five position switch. Yeah, and, yeah, and obviously the Seymour Duncan. Yeah, pickups, so. uh, and the Telly's, you know, I mean, yeah. you got Page doing it and. Yep. Stairway to Heaven. I mean, it's just there's no parallel to that sound. It's a great sound. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's what... That's Beautiful what, guitar. So tell us a little bit more about your setup, because um, we're talking off camera how these days you just tour with this, with the Fractal. Yeah, I do. It's uh, The Fractal is it's life-changing. It was life-changing for me. And like I was telling you, Matt, Matt Picconi has been my personal caretaker on this stuff. I can call him. He logs in and is able to spell me or steer me through these things and then makes a tape of it, sends me as a, as a tutorial. But what's great about this is you've got, you've got so many different uh, sounds that you can have, uh, you know, you have different effects, different amp cabinets, all these things, all in stereo. Um, you know, the different sounds, yeah. you can go from something like a... Yeah. Something like that, just to, to uh, you, you, you basically can go through any sound that you want, and it, you can line them up in a, in a song list. And just pop, 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 pop through, you know, and you can go from, you know, uh, you know, like I say, an octave divider, whatever it happens to be. All your effects are in there. Everything is, is embedded in there and it's going to be the same setting each time. You know, you can, you can, you can click tempo if you want it, but it's all, it's all set. And I can take this thing. It's this, this, uh, about the dimensions there. Take that in one bag and take my, my guitar on the other, the other shoulder. And is I this go, your oh, main touring yeah, guitar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and right on the plane with it. That's it. I just hand it, I sit this thing down, it takes nothing to set up, down, 
Two cannons out, boom, done. It's done. I'm set up. I got the same sound I had in Cleveland I have in Philly. You know, whatever that is. It's exactly the same. I use my in-ears. The volume on the stage is greatly reduced, so no one has to worry about front of the house guy loves you. You know, Front of the house loves that stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So all of that. It's it's um you know, and they've just gotten better and better and better with with all of the the software and they, each time they improve it quite often, the firmware and the software. So uh, I I can't uh, I couldn't do without. I couldn't think about doing this now without it. It's just it's so great. And then you can put it in your hotel room with a pair of headphones and you can practice. Rehearse. Yes, you just mentioned this early guitar, the Dragon guitar. Is that we? Oh yeah, it? I'll show it to you. I'd love to see that. All yeah. Right. yeah, I just love these kinds of guitars because they're like sort of those personal war horses that yeah. You, that you grew up with, that you, you tailor for your own play. Well, and my dad did this. My father painted this on for That's me. fantastic. You know, and it's gold leaf, you know, and then the, the headstock, because I'm a Cancerian, so the, the moon up there. And, yeah, and you can tell it's had a lot, <laughs> a lot of uh, wear and tear. These were harmonics. Uh, you can get those where you can't get them on the neck, so you can all you can get up to, uh, up, you know, another one. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it's a rock and roll guitar. I used it on in Gamma and, and Montrose stuff, you know. It's great, you know. Again, with the, you know. Yeah, so, so it's a Scotty dog up the top there. Huh? A little Scotty dog at the top. Yeah, that's a that's a private joke between my wife and I. <laughs> so every dog that we used to see, we used to call it a Scotty. I can't remember how it originally came up. So she found that he goes, "Here, I got something for your guitar." So yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, it's it's just it, you know, it's again, every guitar is like it's like a different tool in your shed, you know. You um, you know, so we And that was your main guitar for what years? A long, yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of time, yeah. Um, because again, you know, with the wobble arm and, you know, like I said, they're all parallel so I can click. I like how you call it a wobble arm. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> People call it whammy bar. That's too, too metal for me, but it's a wobble arm. Yeah. 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 Anyway. And you always like the Wilkinson one? Yeah. I love them because they're, they're, they they're steady and, uh, you know, uh, Trev has always been supportive, and and uh, it's just a stable unit, and it it has a lot of good snap. To you can do stuff like that. Uh, on other ones, they're sluggish. You know, they don't quite want to wake up in the morning. You know, and they just want to get out of bed. That has a nice a nice you know, hard. So you can do all kinds of you can do different things with it. You know, the, the, it'll vibrate nice. That kind of stuff. You can do some pretty cool stuff with it. You know, depends on what's uh, dying to play it, but it's left-handed. So let me let me let me let me manhandle it he, the wrong way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here. Here you go. We actually come up with better stuff sometimes. Well, it plays great. Flat, yeah, yeah, yeah. Upside down. Yeah, yeah. See, it'll actually come up with cool, cool stuff by having it backwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see, now you know my pain. Right. I like this sound, it reminds me of Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, I'm just walking the yeah, dog yeah, off yeah, Spirit yeah, 76. Yeah. Randy Cassidy, yeah. 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 Yeah, I love it. But, I love uh, it. Actually, you know, having, you know, that's what Zawinul used to do, you know, in Weather Report, he would have a keyboard wired backwards and he would come up with chords. Oh, wow. And go, shit, I like that one. And then he would play yeah. that on, he would 
figure that out and then play it straight on their weather report gigs. So having stuff to run backwards, again, yeah. forces you out of your envelope yeah. of your predictability. Because we all grab, you know, as soon as we put on the guitar, you can always size a musician up sure. as soon as they, what the first thing is out of the box that they play. It's always the same thing every time, usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, they'll play the open A or they'll play, you know, whatever sure. it happens. I always do G... G, D, A. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, right. you're testing different regions yeah, of the yeah. guitar, you know. But it's funny, but, you know, but you can't do that with when it's strung backwards. But you'll come up with stuff that actually yeah. sounds a little unconventional and, and, you know, it can work. You know? Yeah, it's always. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mark, thank you ever so much. I enjoyed it thoroughly, man. It's nice to be asked intelligent questions by an actual musician. Oh, you know. I don't know. When we find one, we'll let you know. Okay, that's what I was okay. I was just putting in the request. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah request yeah. for, next, for so, next time. Are we going to play out? Yeah, let's play out. Thanks, everyone. Here we go. Thank you.